What is up and welcome to another edition of the Bruin Bible. I am so lucky to be joined by my guest today, Locked On Utes in the house, Mr. Brian Brown. What is going on, brother? How you doing? I'm excited. I told you earlier, like, (laughs) I don't get to do fun (laughs) stuff like this. It's always just Utes and and getting to interact with other people. You know, we don't have a ton of Locked On hosts out here in the Pac-12 quite yet. Uh, The few that we do, I, I... kind of know because they're just here in utah but uh, <laughs> this is going to be fun and i'm excited to talk about the pac-12 being that i'm from utah i'm not officially a a pac-12 member really i think we're still in that introductory no. phase but uh i love it out here man it's way better than the mountain west man we love having you guys in the pack because you guys bring competition year in and year out you guys are one of you know the most consistent programs uh and we're going to go over the pac-12 south for listeners Today, we're going to break down over-under win totals for each of the six teams within conference, breakout players, uh, and just specifically for the South, we're going with Offensive Player of the Year and Defensive Player of the Year. So if you're wondering, why isn't Anthony Brown, starting quarterback of Oregon, involved in this? Or, you know, some player from Washington. It's just the Pac-12 South, so we will be focusing specifically on those guys. And, Brian, I'd be remiss if we did not start with your Utes, my man. 18 starters coming back for Utah. You guys got a hell of a transfer portal, too. You guys may have won the whole damn thing when it comes to transfers. And I want to get this off before we start on Utah. Kyle Whittingham, to me, is the most underrated coach in all of college football. You guys play sound football out there. Not a lot of penalties. Always disciplined. Um, Give me your breakdown of the Utes, man. How good do you think this team could be? Uh, Well, it really comes down to who can they get to succeed at the quarterback position. That's the bottom line for this squad because, as you mentioned, Kyle Whittingham, under the radar, underrated, whatever you want to say. Kyle is not a self-promoter. He is more comfortable being in the background, not talking to anyone. You know, he's the kind of guy to where if you go out to, like, a big shindig or a party, he'll be the one in the corner, like, you know, (laughs) looking at his phone, trying to book a flight to Hawaii because he loves to surf or checking the forecast to see if he can go skiing tomorrow. Um, not to say that he isn't personable. You know, he blew up Twitter uh, today on Thursday when he, when he said, uh, which rival, which, you know, tends to upset the BYU faithful when, when they feel like they're disrespected. But he's really gone about building this team in his image. They are tough. They are disciplined. They play hard. They play fast. And they finally found some talent, high-end four-star talent, that match that personality. And they've built this reputation of, of pipelining guys in the NFL to where you can go out in the transfer portal and you can snag a TJ Pledger and a Chris Curry and then a Juco running back like Tavion Thomas. And now all of a sudden you're replaced the backfield and, and maybe even stronger than when, you know, everything went crazy in December. So uh, they've stocked up well. They've got a lot of young players returning. They've played a little bit last year. Uh, There will still need to be some development, but they showed in a five-game stretch that they took a lot of true freshmen and really developed them quick. So I think it's the quarterback position, and and really that's kind of been the bugaboo for Utah all along. Well, just looking at the quarterback position, it's always nice to get a guy with experience. Charlie Brewer was probably the most experienced guy in the portal, and this is no slouch of a guy to get. I mean, he has over 9,700 career yards passing and 60 – five career touchdown passes. I mean, that's a pretty damn good guy to get because you're getting a guy that's advanced. He's not adjusting to the speed of college football. Grant, the Big 12 is, you know, pretty on par with the Pac-12, I think. Maybe we have a little bit better defenses out here. But he's going to be ready to air it out the second he gets there. And if it doesn't happen with Brewer, you guys got Cameron Rising, who beat out Jake Bentley last year and then unfortunately got injured after 14 pass attempts. I mean, this guy – you know, beat out a guy who started for South Carolina. This was a really good true freshman to have. So, I mean, if you're telling me the problems, the quarterback position, from what I'm seeing, you guys are going to have a pretty complete offense because I think either one of those guys can get it done. You mentioned Pledger from Oklahoma, Curry uh, from LSU. That's a pretty damn good backfield. And you add that with Micah Bernard, who averaged 5.1 yards a carry last year. I mean, that's very, very solid right there. Utes, you know, returning a lot of 10 starters on offense. Am I right in that? I mean, that is that's 
pretty damn impressive, man. I think this offense is going to be the least of your worries. Yeah, they actually uh, lost one wide receiver to the transfer portal to Arizona State, and of course the tragic passing of Ty Jordan. Yeah. Um, yeah, right after Christmas, which just rocked the team. But they've overcome it. They've done exactly what Kyle Whittingham would do. They've they've taken adversity. They've used it as a positive, and 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 done a great job of memorializing him, but also building the program. Uh, you know, to continue the legacy that he began he began at Utah. This team is designed the way that Kyle Whittingham wants it. They've got a experienced quarterback you know like i like to joke that mike leach doesn't want to really coach quarterbacks he just wants <laughs> one to show up well i think mike uh mike and kyle have been talking a little too much as their friends and mike's got kyle convinced that he should do the same thing that's what they went and got with charlie brewer and you know cameron rising stepped into that game against usc it was the first game that utah had played all year that usc defense was fired up they'd already played two games he struggled a little bit early on had some nerves but that doesn't mean that he's not capable of, of actually going in and running the offense. I I prefer rising. I think Whittingham prefers Charlie Brewer. Uh, I think uh, we joke that Andy Ludwig will be the first one to buy a NIL version of a Charlie Brewer jersey for the Utes. <laughs> but, uh, you know, he's the perfect fit. And really, it's been a, a an all-in process for Utah to get to this point. I think they always felt that 2021 was the year where they could really compete an attack after losing Tyler Huntley and Zach Moss in 2019. So they are primed and ready to go. Uh, you know, you, you've built some depth through the portal, like you mentioned, to, to manage injuries. So they have as good a shot as anybody. But the Pac-12 South, I, I like to call it the Mad Max Fury Road this season <laughs> because it's going to be mayhem. There's a lot of good teams in this conference. Dude, there's a there's a lot of teams. I could see and you know, call me if I'm biased with UCLA, but they're also returning, I think it's 19 of 22 starters. Thompson Robinson, I think, has a ceiling where it's like he can either be one of the best quarterbacks in the country, or he's gonna be just middle of the pack to the bottom, given his skill set and what we've seen from him in just certain flashes. As he's gonna be there. I think depending on what goes down with Arizona State and those allegations, like they can be incredibly competitive. And we're going to get to all those teams. But we're a big fan of over-unders here on the Bruin Bible. And specifically with the offense, Pac-12 is a very offensive-based conference. Do you think they could have a top-four offense given some of the transfers they've got, given the line that's coming back, given they've got the 10 out of 11 starters coming back? Do you think this could be a top-three offense within the Pac-12? Over-under. Isn't it? It's an interesting question. Um, I think it's probably under just because Kyle Whittingham's not out there to to win with with offense. You know, he loves to win with defense. They're going to do just enough. But this team is built to run the football. That's the bottom line. And and I think it's built well to throw the ball efficiently. In fact, Kyle Whittingham, uh, showcasing his his newly found analytic love, said that the if the passing efficiency for the Utes is over one fifty this year then they'll be fine. And I agree with that. They do not turn the ball over. In fact, if, if you're looking at the teams in the Pac-12 that have been consistently successful, it's Washington, Stanford, Utah. You know, yeah. we've seen USC and, and Oregon kind of bump up and down. But, yep. And they're all teams that ball control. They're teams that run the ball well. And they're teams that play good defense. And, and you're starting to see that even with Mario Cristobal at Oregon, yeah. where they want to run the ball and they want to control uh, – play great defense i think even chip kelly is is on board with that but they do it in a really exciting way um so like it's just i don't know that they're going to be a a potent offense especially with you when you've got like jonathan smith and some of the others that, that really are offensive wizards um but i think they will be able to do enough to get the job done but i'm still gonna go with over or under i mean okay so not a top three offense you say they are defensive base it's a perfect segue into the defense the defense Looks pretty sharp as well. Uh, you know, Devin Lloyd was a finalist for the Butkus Award last year. He's coming back in the linebacking unit. Nephi Suo looked great. And then the guy in the secondary that really stood out to me, Clark Phillips, you know, made some big plays, defle deflected a couple of passes, had that 36-yard pick six against Washington State. You've got guys there. And it's Whittingham's calling card, as you were saying. They're a defensive-based team. Kind of give me what you're thinking about the defense rolling into 2021. It's just it's about finding some spot replacements and depth. I think that's the biggest thing. They lost a starting safety last year in Nate Ritchie to a LDS church mission, which is not a usual thing in college football. But Ritchie was also a very young prospect. There were a few things that he was prone to that he just hadn't quite refined. 
and they do have some guys that are experienced guys in the program that could step in and fill that position. I think you're spot on with Clark Phillips. He was a massive get when they won him in recruiting, yeah. beating out Ohio State, sneaking under the radar. He didn't even have him in their top five or his top three originally, but on the very last minute, switched over to Utah. Uh, but he's shown, you know, why it was why it was a good fit for him. Took his lumps early on, but finished really strong, and people are really excited about him. I'd be remiss if I didn't talk about the guy opposite him in, in JT Broughton, who is the 100-meter champion, uh, state champion from Oklahoma, and he's really developed as a corner as well. So they have a lot of bodies over there. Uh, they will need to find some guys to 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 provide some depth, and they will need to develop a pass rush from somewhere. Mika yeah. Tafua most likely to do that. Um, but, you know, he, he didn't really pop until the very end of the last season, so they'll need to generate that a little bit. And like I said, find a starter at safety and – but it's Kyle Whittingham. He's always going to have a good defense. He's going to find a way. Yeah, and you mentioned Broaden. He earned all Pac-12 honorable mention last year. Vontae Davis is just a senior leader on the defense, too. I mean, you bring him back. It's just a solid guy to have back there, a veteran presence in the secondary. I love it. Here is one of the things I'm most excited for on this podcast. I'm going to put Utah's win total. We're going to go nine and a half. I'm really going to – because I think this team is capable of maybe exceeding that. Over under nine and a half wins, my friend. Where are you going? You, you, you said it perfectly. Like, like clearly, you you know what you're doing here. Um, <laughs> I think the big advantage they have is their non conference games. There's not a huge threat with any of those. Uh, the biggest one by far is is BYU, um, and and that's whether it's at home or on the road is kind of pointless in, in this series because you're 40 miles apart. Um, they do play at San Diego State as well, but. Uh, even though the Aztecs are, are are improved, I don't know that they have the horses to hang with Utah long term. I think the biggest thing is that the schedule is is a little rocky in parts for Utah. That November slate should really determine a lot for them. You know, they've got Oregon coming into town. They should know by that point uh, really where they're at. I think the big key game for them is when they travel to L.A. to play the Trojans in the Coliseum. Um, it'll be fascinating to see where they're at. I just get this feeling being around the team and talking to guys on the team that they are they are gunning for that win. And so I'm going to take the over. It's a little nice. homerish. But but you know, I think that whoever does make it into the conference championship game is probably going to have two losses, whatever division it is that they come from, because it's just a, a, a massive slate and there's nine games. You're always going to lose at least one more than likely. Um, and there's just a lot of talent in this conference this year. It's great. A lot of talent. It's going to make our jobs a lot of fun as well. I think the floor for this team is eight wins. I just know what I'm getting with the Whittingham team, like we said earlier. And I think, you know, 10 wins is in the realm of possibility. They can do that. They're going to probably have to play Oregon or, you know, UW in that title game. They play Oregon in the regular season. And that's a winnable game. I, they could be a top 10 team when all is said and done. I'm just going to throw that out there for Utah fans. I think that's a potential opportunity. That is the ceiling of the Utes. Let's move on to a team that is not highly regarded on this podcast. That is the USC Trojans. Um, you know, Clay Helton really has to find a way to keep his job after this year. Anything less than, I would say, eight wins, he's got to get the ax. I, anything less than nine wins with the talent that I'm seeing from this squad. You know, Keaton Slovis is probably going to be the preseason player of the Pac-12, uh, you know, for Offensive Player of the Year. Uh, they got four or five linemen returning, some beast receivers on the outside, Drake London, Brew McCoy. What are you seeing from this SC team, Brian? Yeah, it's they're, They are returning a lot of talent there, but they also have, have lost some guys that I think were a little underrated. You know, you lost Tyler Vaughn, who was there for a very long time, and he just had a knack for making plays at the right time. You know, he was – a little bit overshadowed. They've had so many good wide receivers there. How can you not, unless you're the guy who's doing everything? I'm also not entirely sold on Keaton Slovis yet. And that's not to say that I don't see some talent there. I do. But really, college football is about consistency. It's That's why why I love it more than the NFL. Because in the NFL, it, it almost always comes down to, you know, what, what team has refined to the most minute detail. College football can be chaos. Because somebody <laughs> yeah. can come out and totally just – all over the place and 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 you've got to clean up the mess and you only got 60 minutes to do it and you know there have been times where we've seen keaton kind of slow struggle with that and you know i don't know about you but last year i didn't really see him do anything that i was just like 
oh my gosh, that's it. He's there. Um, and, and some of that probably is just because I saw him, you know, very early on in the season, you know, struggle a little bit against Arizona state, take his lumps a little bit against Utah. Um, and it's a short season. It's hard to take too much off of it. So that being said, it's the Trojans. They're always going to have talent. They've made sure. some changes on the coaching staff, trying to bring some guys in to bring some juice to the program. Uh, you mentioned Clay Helton being on the hot seat. I think most Pac-12 fans would probably say, no, no, keep that seat nice and cold <laughs> because you don't want to wake the sleeping giant. But it is really a pivotal yeah. point for the program. And and they've got kind of a you know a, a, an interesting schedule to start things out. Um, if they can get through that early slate, they'll be okay. I think it's on the back end where things get a little tricky. I definitely agree with that. And to touch on your point with Slovis, Yes, they went 5-1 and one last year. They lost the Pac-12 title game to Oregon. They went to that game undefeated. But Slovis had seven picks in six games. I mean, that when you're throwing more interceptions than games played, especially at the college level, it's like, wow. You know, that's, that's tough to do. You know what I mean? Especially in a conference, like you said, that prides itself on taking care of the football. You know, the Stanfords of old years, the Whittingham coach teams, things of that nature – I'm a little bullish on Slovis. I think I've seen the upside. The air raid offense does generate a lot of points and a lot of passes, but the turnovers are concerning. And the last time we saw us with a USC quarterback was Darnold in his senior year. He was very turnover prone um, at that point as well. So if any SC fans are listening, I know this is the Bruin Bible. You got to hope that Slovis doesn't turn the football over. Um, they got some good tailbacks too. I think Stephen Carr coming back. Um Vave Mayo Peel, I think his name is. He's very talented running back. Uh, he'll be back in action there as well. Uh, but like you said, I mean, they, they even lost Elijah Vera Tucker, who from my recent memory was probably one of the most talented linemen I'd seen in the Pac-12. I mean, this guy was just mauling people in the run game for SC and was a huge part of the reason that Stephen Carr and you know the other tailbacks had such – big holes on the line. So with Vera Tucker gone, that is a big, big loss on the offense. Um, I'm going to spin it back to you on the over under once more. Is this a top three offense over under in the pac 12? I, I do think it is simply because they're going to put up numbers and they've got talent on there. You mentioned Stephen Carr, you mentioned uh, Malapai. And also the transfer portal was good to them with Keon, Keontae. Okay, and Ingram. Ingram. Yeah. And, and you put on top of that, like, I want to be a quarterback because I want to throw to Drake London. Like I'm just going to throw it out there. Like that's a that's a kind of, the kind of target that I want to throw to. And um, you know, I think defensively they've got some real stars over there. Like we haven't really gotten to it quite yet, but Drake Jackson, um, yeah, you know, two Drakes, one team. That's impressive. We'll, we'll just go ahead and throw <laughs> it out there for USC. Uh, but I do think that, that the offense can put up the numbers to be a top three offense. Now, is that going to win them all the games that they need to win? That's going to be the part that I'll be curious about. Yeah, touching on the Drakes, they're only missing the one from Canada, my guy out in Toronto. Uh, Drake London, it's just some guys are just unfair with how much talent they're gifted. This guy played Division I basketball, just casually switched over to football as a hobby, and he was arguably the best receiver in the Pac-12 last year. Drake London is just incredibly gifted. It would not shock me if he's in the All-American conversation by the end of the year. Just given how that offense is designed, the air raid style, he was absolutely dominant. I mean, the UCLA game, I'm watching that. He breaks three tackles in the open field and just goes to the house. Just like, I don't even know how you would stop this guy on the run. So Drake London is very talented. Let's move to the defense. I know you mentioned the other Drake, Drake Jackson. This guy is a two-time uh, All-Pac-12 selection coming back. Uh, they got the number one overall recruit in the country, too, coming in there, Corey Foreman who may make some, you know, ruffle some feathers uh, coming in as an SC defensive end. Uh, you know, we saw a very similar situation with Kayvon Thibodeau going up to Oregon. You know, he was a number one recruit guy, came in, played immediately. You know, SC always has talent. They never lack that. And despite only playing six games last year, they matched their 2019 uh, results with 16 takeaways um, in just six games. So they were able to force turnovers on the opposing offense. Uh, from Todd Orlando's defense. Any other guys stand out to you on the defensive side of the ball? Uh, you know, I, I, I'll be honest. Like, I think what they lost is really what stood out to me in the year previous. So they, they've got some guys that they're going to have to bring back. And also being a former offensive lineman, there's just something about, uh, you know, defensive 
uh, ends that haunt all my nightmares constantly. <laughs> um, so, so I'm going to go ahead and just, you know, throw that one out there. Um, stay out of my dreams, Drake Jackson. I don't need you there. I don't need to be worrying about that. Like I'll leave that up to, you know, some of the real Pac-12 offensive tackles. But, um, you know, I, I think Isaiah Paula Miles is one that, that I'm curious to see yeah. how he does. Um, like you mentioned, the young and coming in, uh, you know, as a true freshman, seeing the kind of impact that he can have there. Uh, that's always a curious thing. You know, I, I remember seeing Kayvon Thibodeau, Thibodeau as a true freshman in the Pac-12 championship game. And you saw the impact that he could have with just the f- sheer athletic physical abilities. And so that's always the wild card, right? Do you have a freshman that can come in and overcome the lack of experience with just f- just pure physical gifts and make an impact. And I think that's always something to watch out for. Thibodeau and Foreman are the type of guys that could have gone to bars when they were like 12 years old. Like yes. <laughs> they get yes. off, the, they get off the bus first and it's just like, Oh crap. Like that guy is league bound. I have no doubts about it. And Foreman definitely fits that picture. I think he's coming in at like a slender, like two sixty, and runs like a four, six, you know, as a senior in high school, as a defensive end, it's just like, it's unfair, man. It's just unfair, you know. Yeah, that, that, that ain't right. That's just not fair. And and maybe I should give a little credence to you. It'll be interesting to see if Sarah Wright can duplicate his amazing performance in Space Jam 2 yeah. as a USC Trojan. I don't know if he can. It was so legendary as uh, LeBron's kid. But um, just getting back to it, like they just have insane athletes. And it's – I don't know, man. It, it, it can be unfair at times, but also you kind of have to watch some of that and just be like – Grateful that you get to see that happen in your conference. Totally. It's, you know, they are that the hated team. I think they just had the most prestige. And, you know, if you're not rooting for them, you're against them type of thing. But it's always fun to play SC, just knowing the caliber that they have. And if you do have a chance to beat them, that's such a great thing. You can, you know, tell your program, your fans, things of that nature. Let's hit it on the over-under with the win totals here. Um, I think it's nine and a half as well. I think that's a very fair assessment with SC. Uh, my man, Brian, where are you going with that? It's a tough one because it, y- y- you really look at their schedule, and I think that's the part about it that makes it a little bit, I don't want to say dicey, but complicated, right? Because you have a game against Notre Dame at Notre Dame in the middle of the season. Depending on how healthy you are coming into that game, you're coming off a bye week, obviously, but you're playing Utah the week before. Um, you know, you get Stanford early in the season, so that's always a, a crapshoot because you don't know what Stanford's going to be necessarily. But Stanford seems very confident in what they developed in the offseason. But then you finish out your slate with California, UCLA, and BYU. It's a tough one. It really is. Uh, my mind wants to say that they're going to go over. Um, my heart and my gut thinks that Clay Helton's <laughs> lost the wheel and that they'll probably go under. I love it, that, man. That and I just want to pander to everybody else in the Pac-12 who hates USC like I do. So, <laughs> You and I both. I was getting that R. Kelly song where he's like, my mind's telling me no. That's right. That's right. I'm like, do I do it? Do I say it on the podcast? I don't know. I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. Man, yeah. You got you got the pipes to make it work if you wanted to. I'm sure of it. But uh, we're, I'm going to go with – you know, if I have Utah winning 10 games, it's hard for me to put them at 10 as well. Since I'm on a podcast with a locked on Utes guy and I already picked them to win 10 games, I don't think I can do it. I think I'm going to go with nine wins. I think it's just enough to keep Clay Helton at his position, which we are all fans of in the Pac 12. So everybody wins, essentially. I think that's a move. I think they get nine wins. Yeah. You put the blame on me, man. It's perfect. I'm the guy who just showed up out of nowhere and everybody's like, who's this cat? You know, so it's perfect. <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll team up together on this one. Plus, there's, there's never enough. USC hate you can always have just a little bit more oh yeah and this is you know coming from the Bruin Bible I mean we freaking hate USC so we're all in support of that I actually think that this this is another year where UCLA could get them I really do I feel like if DTR is healthy and everything like that like it could be it I, I like the Bruins this year I'm crazy but I like them Let's let's take it to the Bruins. Let's just do that right now. You know, this is a Bruin-based podcast. Um, <laughs> might as well, right? <laughs> might as well, man. I mean, we wouldn't be doing our jobs if we weren't. 19 of 22 starters returning, all five offensive linemen. Dorian Thompson, Robinson coming back. And anyone who listens to this podcast knows I have an absolute football man crush on Greg Dulcich, the tight end we have. 
because he reminds me – I'm a 49ers fan. He reminds me of George Kittle so much, and he wears 85. He blocks like a champion. He runs routes. He's outrunning DBs. You get him in the open field, he doesn't avoid contact. He goes right at you. I mean, this guy had 167 yards receiving against SC in that game. Best player on the field, bar none. This is a guy who I think could win the Mackey Award at some point. And then you get two running backs and Britton Brown and Zach Charbonnet, who like, you know, Charbonnet was the bell cow for Michigan his freshman year. I mean, that's a really good transfer to get. And Britton Brown, I mean, this guy probably would have been drafted last year if he left. I mean, he averaged over six yards a carry at the running back position. You insert Chip Kelly, who granted has not had success at UCLA, but I also feel like he doesn't have a roster like he's had, like he does this year. Give me your take on UCLA, man. I know I'm a, being a homer right now, but I want to hear uh, the outsider's perspective. But that's always the best people to talk to, right? The people who know the team in and out, who follow it, who 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 want the team to be successful because they they genuinely have to look at the positives and the negatives in conjunction and be like, okay, how excited can I really get about my team? But I thought you nailed it. I love Sean Ryan. Sean Ryan and I yeah. like it's awkward, but I've had a Sean Ryan poster in my bedroom for a while now. But former offensive lineman, I feel like I get a little bit of leeway with that. But Got he's it. incredible. And and he's a mauler. He's a perfect fit for a chip Kelly offense. I love what they do in the run game. It's not as electric as it was at Oregon, but they do a lot of fun stuff with the counters and the shifts and everything like that. Talking about Dulcich, he's a He's a boss. Like, like that's it, you know. And and he's multidimensional. He's a guy who can block and catch, stretches a defense well. Um, you know, there's a lot to like there offensively. I think um big running backs, backs that fit into Chip's system, backs that can get downhill. And once they get downhill and get in the secondary, they can really cause some damage and cause some explosive plays. That's the big part about college football, is you have to have those. 15 yard plus gains these are young players they don't have the kind of mentality that nfl guys do where they can give up a big play and bounce back and and be a goldfish like ted lasso likes to say right oh. so so Sorry, it's, I I'm a, interject ted lasso is like my favorite show right now <laughs> I, it, if awesome. you're not watching it and loving it like i i drop little ted lasso bits and all my shows and everything like that I've, I've been obsessed since last year um but yeah it's that's, and that's really what UCLA, I think, has to be, is they have to be goldfish as well. They have to forget what's happened in the past, right? This is a, a new team with a lot of talent, a lot of potential, a lot of ability. I think DTR is primed to really have a breakout year. I'm a fan of his as well. You know, I, I've kind of followed him ever since he was at Bishop Gorman. Um, but I think, you know, if he stays healthy, if the offense stays on track, if he can really buy into what Chip's trying to get him to do, you know, he has so much potential to make plays manage plays you know like use that potential when you need to not just when you want to and then they could be a really explosive offense and i think that's really what makes them dangerous in the pac-12 south is how do you stop that offense yeah i mean you nailed it man uh sean ryan i think you could make an argument maybe jackson kirkland out in UW, but this guy might be the best tackle in the class he's a future nfl player i think he's going to be if he continues his path and he's balling out again this year. I think he's a top three-round NFL selection. I think that's not even a controversial take, given that he was a two-year starter immediately in the Pac-12. This will be his third year in a row. He's a junior. He can come out as an underclassman. So I'm a huge Sean Ryan guy. Alec Anderson, the other bookend tackle, has been great too. Keep an eye out for him at right tackle. But DTR is the guy. He, you know, he. I think he was always a guy that – was a quarterback trying to learn the position because he was a wide receiver at Bishop Gorman until he converted to the spot. Last year, you finally saw kind of a jump with him. It's like, oh, this guy is actually understanding the position. This could be scary for the rest of the conference. First time he completed over 60% of his passes, 12 touchdowns, four picks. And, I mean, his ability to just run the football, too. I mean, this guy ran for over 300 yards, five touchdowns, too. I mean, you incorporate that in with this team. It's pretty outstanding. Um, and I think UCLA, let's do the top three offense again. Is this a top three offense in the Pac-12? I actually say yes on this one. Yeah, yeah, we're 100% in agreement here. I think people just discount the ability that Chip Kelly has to build a running game. And when you have a weapon like DTR, 
You can use Dorian in so many different fashions and that you don't have to use him, but the threat of using him, you know, I, I know for a fact that Kyle Whittingham is already losing sleep over that because he absolutely hates running quarterbacks and what they can do to a defense. And, you know, I think Justin Fry has done a great job and, and yeah, I know Chip Kelly's the offensive guru, but you still have to have an offensive coordinator that sets a practice plan every week that coaches up his guys on the offensive line. I think he's done a great job. I think they're just going to continue to evolve. You know, Kyle Phillips is a guy that, uh, you know, yeah. sneaky, good player, slot guy, can do a lot of different things. And, and you know, I'm one of those people that thinks that you have to have interchangeable players. And that's – Kyle Phillips emulates that to, to a T, where he can do a lot of different things. He can create some matchups. And really, that's where Chip and, and his staff are brilliant is, is creating those matchups. So, yeah, I think this is going to be a top three offense uh, without a doubt. You know, there's not a lot up in the north to make me think that there's going to be challengers up there. I agree with that. I think the only offense that is worth noting, uh, at least as a complete offense, you know, Washington State always has the air raid run and shoot offense. You know, Oregon's going to be up there. You know, they have Verdell coming back top three receivers. Anthony Brown looks to stretch the defenses with some dual threat ability, but I agree. I think there's not a lot of threats in the North. Um, maybe UW gets in that conversation. Maybe not, but yeah, I agree with UCLA being a top three offense. Defense is pretty strong too. We're just going to kind of gloss over this as we got to get to some other teams. I know people who listen to this podcast know we've harped on the defense a lot. Caleb Johnson, uh, a linebacker that had five and a half sacks in six games last year he's coming back that's a big guy to get and Quinn Lake you know the safety returning this guy's when he's healthy is the big question he's only played over five games in his career once and he's a senior this year when he's healthy he has been you know an all Pac-12 performer when he plays so if we can keep that guy healthy Caleb Johnson builds on a sack total D-line comes out uh, we can properly replace Osa Odigizua we're gonna be a good team and I think this UCLA team, let's put them at let's put them at eight and a half wins. That sounds like the right call there. Um, are they over or are they under? I'm going to go over, and that may sound crazy because I just don't – you know, it's so hard with the South because every single week is a battle, and, and it's just the Pac-12 in general. And I really liked what uh, Jimmy Lake said. Uh, it, at the Pac-12 Media Days where he said it's a great conference because you're going to see something different every single week, and, and that's the fact of the matter. Uh, but you look at their out-of-conference schedule, there's that big one against LSU. I think that's one where you highlight it and see, hey, we're really going to find out what this team is made of and how good they are after that one. But winnable game against Hawaii, winnable game against Fresno State You know, for your out-of-conference. So that gets you really close to that nine-win total. And then, you know, I think the dynamic of the South really shifted with all that's gone on at Arizona State. I really do. It's these are young kids. And, yeah, you still got talent there. You still got kids that can play football. But if you're bonded tightly to a coach and that coach can't show up and you're wondering what's going to happen, that's going to weigh on you. And, and, and so I'm really curious to see what they do. Uh, but crossover games against Oregon and Stanford, I, I think those are doable games. But even so, if you lose one or two of those, you know, you still have some room in the South at that point to lose one more game and get to nine wins. So I think it's definitely doable. I think you're totally right. I've got them specifically slated at nine wins, nine and three. Chip Kelly keeps his job. Momentum keeps building for the future. One can hope as a Bruins fan. Who knows if that's the case? But I think that is the ceiling of this team. I think nine wins, if they can reach that. That would be incredibly impressive. Uh, you mentioned Arizona State. Herm Edwards coming back for his third season as the head coach. Big year in Tempe, I think, just because this could be the last year they got Jaden Daniels there. Um, who knows how long Herm Edwards is going to be there, by the way. I think that's kind of an underlying – he doesn't need to coach college football. He's doing it just because he likes to. I think if he's successful this year, there's more of a chance that the program moves in the right direction. But if it's a bad year – for Arizona State, and they fail to miss those, I really think there's a chance Edwards can walk away. I know that's a you know just a theory of mine, but I don't believe he needs to be coaching there given his background and history as he was a successful NFL coach. Um, they got four or five stars returning on the offensive line. Jaden Daniels, one of the most exciting quarterbacks in all of college football. Um, the game he's going to be playing DTR, it's like when we had um, – it's like a poor man's version of what we saw with Deshaun Watson – 
uh, playing Lamar Jackson. <laughs> like that's my version of that back in college football. I think uh, those guys are incredibly fun to watch. And that's a game I'm going to be glued to the couch. Probably going to be like a 45, 38 win for whoever pulls that one out. Top four rushers returning. Rashad White was actually insane. If you break it down, he had 420 yards on 42 carries. So he averaged 10 yards a carry last year with five touchdowns. Uh, and they return their top four receivers from last year. So the offense is looking pretty good at ASU. What do you think about that? Yeah, I, I think it's definitely poison. There's a lot of, there's a lot of weapons on that offensive side of the football. You mentioned uh, Rashad White. I think Chip Trainum is another guy that compliments him well. They went and stole a wide receiver from Utah in Brian Thompson that I think oh. didn't really get a chance to showcase his, his skill set at Utah uh, because they didn't throw him the ball enough, bottom line. And, and he'll definitely get passes thrown his way. Uh, Jaden Daniels is another guy I'm a big, big fan of. Uh, Bunkley Shelton, another versatile piece that can do a lot. Y you always wonder who's going to be the go-to guy, and I think that's really the question mark for Arizona State this year. Who is that that juice, that Nikhil Harry, uh, that um, – Brandon Ayuk. Oh, yeah, Ayuk. Um, gosh, why does it always happen that when you're on the podcast, you forget the names, right? Um, you know, and, and we've seen what Ayuk's done in the NFL with the San Francisco 49ers, and, and he's shown that athleticism, that explosive ability we saw here. So that's my question mark, right? And then they have there's been so much conversation about the offensive line, you know, and it, they're still a pretty young group. I know that Donovan West is a really heralded guy in there at the interior. Uh, I know they really like the the transfer at left tackle. I believe it's Deesh is how they pronounce it, or Deitch. Um it's a running gag on our uh, Locked On Pac-12 podcast that we just don't know how to pronounce names. So uh, I'll just carry it over here. But I'm curious to see how good that unit really is because when it was in Utah in 2019, it was porous, and then they absolutely destroyed it. And, and it'll also be a curiosity to see how well this coaching staff manages that roster. I don't know that I've ever seen Arizona State be uh, – consistently explosive on the offensive side of the football. I'll put it that way. Um, you know, we've seen programs in the past where it was, you know, Washington State, I think is a great example, where they were hanging 40 and 50 points every single game. It doesn't feel like Arizona State really goes out to do that. And maybe some of that is the the her mentality. He does come from the NFL. Like you said, he doesn't really need to be there. I think he's just there because he likes being around kids and being a good influence. Um, I, I'm, I'm really curious to see what all the uh, – hangover is from the NCAA inv investigation and, and I've heard some things uh, regarding that that make me think that it is going to be pretty serious down the end of the road. How quickly does that actually you know, take place is, is the real question mark. Um, so talent is there. We really, I don't know that we've really seen Arizona State post a, a really prolific offense uh, under Herm. So I'm curious about that aspect of it. Uh, but really, can you ever count them out, especially in a year like this where things are up for grabs? No, I think that's totally accurate. And, um, you know, you mentioned all the guys. Johnny Wilson's another receiver to throw his name in there. Big, talented receiver. He was a five-star on some websites that is now going to his sophomore year. Him and Bunkley Shelton, I, I, I'm totally spot on with you. I think Daniels is going to be good, but he needs to find that weapon that he can rely on outside of, you know, the running back room and Rashad White. So if he can have one of those guys kind of, live up to expectation maybe a little earlier in their career than they were expected to. That's only going to help ASU moving forward. And uh, before we move on to the defense, let's continue with the uh, offense. Is this a top three offense in the Pac-12 over under? I'm going to say under just because I have concerns. that Will Jane Daniels stay healthy throughout an entire season? He's still not gained weight, and he's incredibly slight. Now, he's been durable, but how long can he stay durable for, really? Um, and the other part of it, too, is just you've got a lot of pieces there. Are you going to be able to scheme to put them in action to really generate that? So I'm going to go with under. I'm willing to be proven wrong on this one. But like Herm Edwards is a 17 and 13 as, as the head coach. Right. So like we give him so much credit and props and they've done a great job on the recruiting trail. Uh, but we haven't quite seen it materialize. And so in, until I actually see it happen with my eyes, I'm going to have to say no. I think that's a fair assessment. And, you know, I'm I'm willing to do the same thing. If they do prove us wrong, like, yeah, they, they did it. I mean, if Rashad White's running for 10 yards a carry on over 100 yards, I mean, or 100 carries as well, that's going to be a guy that's just going to be a problem for defenses moving forward. But let's move to the defense. This defense is actually better than I thought it was when I broke it down. 
you have two four-year starters, the linebacker position, Merlin Robertson, Darian Butler. Their secondary, get this, all four players have at least 25 starts in Division I football. Uh, Jack Jones, former USC transfer out there. Chase Lucas are kind of the headliners of that group. But that's a veteran secondary. And this defense led the Pac-12 in points uh, per game allowed last year at uh, 21 uh, 21.8, I believe. So it, it's just an impressive unit. They've got a lot of veterans coming back that know what they're supposed to be doing. They're not going to be, you know, changing out, learning new defenses as it's pretty stable there. Uh, what do you think about the defense uh, for the Sun Devils this year? Yeah, I'll echo what you said. I'm a big fan of Merlin Robertson, and they do have a lot of experience coming back. Uh, the question I always have with them with running that three down scheme. How do they survive in the Pac-12 South with so many teams that want to establish the run game? Uh, we know that that scheme works really well in the NFL. Uh, we know that it works well with with teams that want to be versatile and 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 you know move pieces around, especially more like that air raid style offense. So you have to think that they'll be stout against USC, and they will pressure the quarterback. But how do they hold up against the run game? Because you've got a lot of teams in this conference: Stanford, Utah, Oregon. Uh, not so much USC anymore, but UCLA all want to establish the run game, right? Washington has gone all in on the tight ends and establishing the run game. So we've seen this shift to where everybody wants big physical tight ends who can catch the football and block. And they also want to make, you know, make some yards. Uh, you do get some games off, I think, in terms of like Colorado and Arizona, where we still just don't know who they are. And I say games off, but it's, are they, do we know? I mean, we don't know yet. Right. <laughs> and, 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 and so those ones I always have a hard time where I can't like watch the film and, and make some evaluations. But uh, this defense brings back a lot of experience, and you always have to like that. Um, you just hope that they can find ways to to get those guys to make plays. Um, and, and sometimes I wonder if maybe you like you have some individual stars who can really show out and look great, but you don't play necessarily as well as a team. So that may be a little bit of what ASU suffered from in the past, but we'll see. I'm just I'm I know there's talent on that team and I know there's great players. I just haven't seen anything from them over the last few years to make me think that this is going to be the year that they make the jump into becoming a great program. I agree with that. And they were 86th in the country last year against the run. Not ideal, especially in a conference that runs the ball so heavily. Um, let's do the over under. I think eight is the perfect number for that. I think eight is the number where it's like you can either do a push on this one or you can go over or under. Where are you feeling? Eight is a good number for them. And and right now, I think until I get some clarification on who's actually going to be on the sidelines for their coaching staff, I have to go under. Um, I've been around programs that are in turmoil before. I have no doubt that Herm Edwards can turn some things around and, and, and use it as some motivation. I just wonder how long kids can, can, can compete under that. Uh, cloud hanging over things, and, and we know the NCAA isn't out to make any any changes or any restrictions immediately. They're going to wait until the season's over and, and let things play out. Uh, so I, I'm going to sneak in the under there. I also um, say that with a caveat of, of this is probably going to be me getting proved wrong because this is probably going to be the year that they do actually make the jump. Um <laughs> But yeah, yeah, I, I I think eight's perfect. You know, that's the right the the right amount that the right total to set that line at. And I'm gonna I'm gonna swing for the under. I think that's fair. I think I'm gonna go with the push. I think they're an eight and four team. I think if Daniels is healthy and given he's gonna be a three year starter at this point, maybe an NFL draft pick. You know, if things do go as well as his way this year, I think that's just a perfect number. I think eight and four Sun Devils fans can get hyped. You know, it's Obviously, it's not the Pac-12 championship game, but it's a very successful year overall. You know, you're making a bowl game. Nothing to really complain about. I think that's the typical ASU number. We're going to move on to Colorado, a team that really surprised last year. I think a lot of people. Carl Durrell, in his first year as the head coach of Colorado, went 4-2, and two, winning his first four games. They lost the last two. Uh, but there's a lot of reasons to be excited here. They get the returning Pac-12 player of the year in Jarek Broussard. This guy nearly got 1,000 yards in six games. I mean, this dude was incredibly impressive. He averaged 149 yards a game on the ground for Colorado. They returned their top two receivers, uh, including Dimitri Stanley, who averaged 17 yards a catch last year, and LaVisca Chenault's brother, 
Uh, Levante grabbed seven, 17 passes last year, got in the end zone. Um, one of the guys I'm really excited about too is Jerry Rice's son. Brendan Rice is going to be there. Three touchdowns last year. He may have a, an advanced role. Obviously, I mentioned I'm a Niners fan at the end of this podcast. So, Brendan Rice, you got a fan in me already. Uh, give me your thoughts on Colorado. Like you said, it starts and ends with Jared Broussard. He was he was a beast last year, kind of came out of nowhere. Uh, I'm excited to see what he does. Breaking in a new quarterback, I think there are weapons there to work with. I think they've always been pretty stout up front. They've done a good job of developing offensive linemen. So that'll be my curiosities. You know, I like Brendan Rice too. Like I grew up a Niners fan, grew up in the Bay Area. So Jerry Rice holds a special place in my heart. And I think, you know, I saw some things last year to where he can make some serious plays. Like he's got some juice to him. He might have a little bit more wiggle than the old man did. I don't know that he's quite the technician or the athlete, but, uh, you know, I saw him make make some of the Utah's guys miss last year and do some good things, so I'm excited about that for sure. Um, I just think there's a lot of question marks with his offense. I love Nate Landman. I hope he comes back yeah. and, and has a healthy se- season for Colorado. He's a massive dis- difference maker there in the middle, and they've done really well, I think, in the transfer portal. They've, they've gone out and gotten some good guys. Uh, to, to plug some holes, you know, uh, Antonio Alfano is one uh, that they lost, um, you know, and that's a big loss, I think. But uh, they've they've managed to do a pretty decent job of, of filling those things in. It'll be interesting to see how some of those transfers work out. Um, you know, I think they've done a pretty good job of, of trying to build some depth and done a pretty good job on the recruiting trail. So uh, this year is almost kind of a free season, though, because we still don't really know what they are. And last year was such a weird year anyways absolutely and i think uh nate landman as you mentioned former uh first team all pack 12 selection twice towards achilles last year is now back in the lineup so i'm rooting for nate it's good to have him back out in the field the other guy carson wells i mean this guy led the pack 12 in tackles per loss per game he averaged 2.7 a game last year those are you know two of the best linebackers in the conference might be the best linebacking group in all of the Pac-12. So that'll be fun to watch. Um, I got the over-under win total at five and a half. Uh, Where do you think that ranks with Colorado? I I mean, I don't know if you're out there in Vegas or something like that because you're setting (laughs) these perfectly right where they should be uh, every single time. Um, I don't think they go over. And and my biggest thing is they're just bringing too much new talent into the the equation. And and while Broussard is a, a tremendous player, He's not going to sneak up on anybody this year. Everybody knows he's coming. And unless you see some real uh, evolution on the offensive side of the ball, um, you know, we talked about Brendan Rice. He's, he's a very talented player. I don't know that he's a game breaker necessarily to where he can he can be the sole focus of, of defenses. Um, and maybe that's just my naivete. I know that they went out and got a, a tight end in the transfer portal. Um, I don't know how good he is either. And I don't know if a tight end is enough to really make an offense great. Uh, uh, but the, the big thing for me is is what what do we see from the quarterback? I believe it's JT uh, Stroud that's going to be starting for them, if I'm not mistaken. Um, yeah, I've got that too. I think Brendan Lewis is also competing for the starting job out there. So you got uh, kind of the starting quarterback room um, open with Sam Neuer transferring to Oregon State. So that'll be a fun matchup to watch out in Colorado. I'm going to go with five wins, so I'm just going to take the under. I don't think they're a bad team, but just given how talented this Pac-12 is, specifically the South, these are teams that are all going to be playing. I just think it's unrealistic for them to expect more than five wins this year. And I think five wins is actually a win for this program, right? Because you hired a new head coach in the middle of a pandemic, essentially. Uh, He had to scramble on the fly. I heard an interview with him that he didn't even meet his entire team until like August, which is insane in the world of college football. So for them to do all that on the fly – and, and play as well as they did last year. I think it really speaks to, to Carl Durrell, his ability. Uh, but, you know, five wins, that's a pretty good year for this program as they're still in that transition phase. And, it, and that's something that you can build on going into next season as well. Anything more than that, any, anything more than five wins, Durrell is going to be maybe looking for another job very soon out of Colorado. <laughs> <laughs> and to quote uh, – To quote the opposite of one of my favorite Ted Lasso quotes, football is not life if you're playing for the University of Arizona. This is going to be a tough year in Tucson. Um, Three and nine last year, or no, oh and five last year, I should say. Sorry, 
0 and 5. Um, you know, not a lot coming back. Jed Fish coming back, the former OC for UCLA. I will say that they got a good, a big steal in the defensive coordinator and Don Brown. I really like what I'm seeing from him. He, outside of last year at Michigan, he's always put up solid defenses, whether it's at Boston College, whether it's at Michigan. Um, not a lot of bright spots. Uh, Michael Wiley is a running back that looks great. I mean, he averaged 7.2 yards a carry last year, over 200 yards, three touchdowns. Um, Jamari Joyner, I mean, this guy is a returner slash receiver. You know, he showed some pop at least. Um, talk me into why University of Arizona is probably going to be the worst team within the Pac-12. I, 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 where do I start? <laughs> you know, <laughs> uh, that program has been in shambles basically since Rich Rod left it. And, and you know, I know that they, they were really high on what was coming into the program with Kevin Sumlin. Sumlin was just not, I think, prepared for what that job really needed. I think Jed Fish probably is a little bit more so than most. Uh, he's brought a great spirit and attitude. Uh, but as as I like to say, hope is not a strategy. You know, like I know that rebellions are built on hope, uh, but it shouldn't be your main strategy. And that's really all Arizona has right now. An exodus from the program, the transfer portal. They did not have a great recruiting class. And and I know that people love to argue against rankings, but the the stark reality is, is that the people who rank those classes do a pretty darn good job of it, and, and usually it translates pretty well. You've got to be a top 30 class to be, to be consistent, and you've got to be a top 10 class to even have a sniff at the college football playoff and the championship, um, and, and they've got none of that. So, you know, that's <laughs> fine. It's a rebuilding year for them. You know, you're going to try and, and find some guys, I think, this year. Um you know, there are some names that are familiar to, to me there uh, uh, on the roster, but I, I just don't I just don't see it happening for them this year because there's there's no real game breaker talent, and maybe somebody emerges that we haven't heard of. Uh, I just don't see it happening this year. Yeah, I think there's just not a lot to ride home about with the University of Arizona. Um, you know, I think as I mentioned earlier, I think I thought they were going to be a three and nine team. I kind of blew that at the beginning. Three wins may be asking for a lot with this team, given that they went 0-5 last year. Uh, Gunnar Cruz, probably going to win the quarterback battle out there, from what I'm hearing. Uh, transfer from Washington State. Uh, so he's used to passing the ball a lot, which should be exciting for Wildcats fans. They got, I mean, Stanley Berryhill was a pretty solid receiver out there. But, you know, it's just a pretty bleak situation in Tucson. Let's give, him, let's give Jed Fish a couple more years to try to build this program up. But uh, if you're a U of A football fan, you're thinking long term. You know, this may not be the year, but in a couple of years, we may be back in a bowl game, back to competing within the Pac-12 South. Do you think three wins is fair? Oh, definitely fair. And I think you mentioned at the top, that Don Brown coming to that program, I think, is, is a big deal. I do like Jalen Harris and Anthony Pandy. I think those are players that Don can do some things with. But again, it's it's the the lack of talent around a few guys that they really don't have. And if, if you're going to compete in the Pac-12 week in, week out, you've got to have depth. You've got to have talent across the board to match your stars. Uh, you know, We've talked about everybody, and, and there's two or three guys on almost every single team outside of Colorado that, that we instantly think of and think, man, like that guy's a star. That guy's going to play in the NFL. You know, day two, day three guy. And th th we've had so many names that we've thrown out, and you get to these teams and you're like, well, I like him. But some of these guys are probably just regular starters on other Pac-12 teams. And so if you're putting anything above, you know, four, five, six wins, you're just – you're asking too much of that program. And, and I think that they're on the cusp of, of doing better. I think they've got a good start to things. You know, anytime you get Gronk out for the spring game, that's got to be a good sign, right? Um, yeah. But, yeah, no, I think three is perfect, you know, and and, and even two or, two or three wins in a season, I think there's something to build off of there. Uh, but it's just it's going to be a long season for Arizona, and I think they know that. Yeah, yeah, I think the fans are aware. Did you see him catch that ball from the helicopter in that spring thing? That was so damn cool. Like they got to find a way to spark the program. I mean, you just got to get Gronkowski catching balls from a helicopter three hundred feet in the air. Hey, man, I watched the video. I thought it was pretty cool. So maybe, hopefully, some recruits are out there seeing that as well. Brian, I know you got to go soon. Um, let's just get our offensive player of the year and our defensive player of the year in. Uh, and by the way, dude, you've been an awesome guest. So I'll let you start <laughs> off. Who do you got as offensive player of the year in the Pac-12 South? 
it, it's a tough one, and and I'm not, you know, I think it's going to be Jaden Daniels or DTR. I think those are the two guys. I lean a little bit towards Jaden just simply because he's got a little bit more experience under his belt. You know, we've seen DTR kind of be a little bumpy in camp, not not being able to participate fully quite yet, right? I think he's supposed to play on Friday or, or practice on Friday. Uh, I don't think that really worries me necessarily, but I just think Jaden uh, has a little bit more to him. And I think that he, if I'm looking at it, it's almost always a quarterback. It, it's unfortunate to say that, but that's just the reality of it. Um, I think Jaden's probably better than Keen Slovis. I think his numbers are going to be better. I think that offense will be better. If DTR stays healthy, he's my guy. I'm going to ride that horse. I'll, I'll be there for it hundred um, percent. But just kind of think that Jaden has a slight edge. As far as defensive players, I, I got to be a homer on this one. Devin Lloyd Do is it. an absolute freak of a talent. You know, you said that he was he was a finalist last year for the Butkus. He's a fine or a, he's on the watch list for just about every single uh, award that a defensive player can be on this season. And the best part about it is he doesn't have to sit back there and tell all the other 10 guys what to do this year because they've been there for a year. So he's going to be freed up to do a lot more things. They built some depth behind him. They can rotate some guys in. And, uh, you know, I think he's he's definitely a candidate to be second overall in the Pac-12 for Defensive Player of the Year because I think we all know who's going to be first. Um, yeah. But I'm going to be a little little homerish with that because he is so versatile. He can cover. He can rush the passer. He covers incredible ground in the open field. And he's just a tremendously well-prepared player. I love it, man. Well, you stole my pick with Lloyd, so I'm going to pivot away from that. I think uh, I think one of Robertson, Merlin Robertson, or Chase Lucas can do it. I think just the senior leadership, if Arizona State's able to eclipse that eight-win mark, uh, the defense is going to have to make up some big plays. So I think one of those guys is going to be my pick for Defensive Player of the Year. Offensive, I'm going to probably go the same pick, DTR. Obviously, this is a UCLA podcast. I can't pivot for my guy. Slovis has got to be in there. Um, and you know, Jaden Daniels, if Jaden Daniels is able to put together, I think this could be a potential big year for all those dudes. Uh, Brian, dude, you are the absolute man. Thank you so much for coming on brother. Hey, it's a blast. I love talking about the pac 12. I love doing it in this kind of a format. I think Twitter is terrible for good conversations about football. <laughs> this is a lot more fun and, and really, you know, I am a Utah fan and I, I cover the Utes for, for a podcast, but I really love watching football out here. I believe that this is the best conference in the country as far as entertainment value goes. I'm not going to try and argue that we're better than the SEC when it comes to actual players, um, but it's an absolute blast. And it's been a joy to be with you tonight, man. You know, anytime I get to meet a fellow Ted Lasso fan, that's a great day. Dude, you couldn't have said it any better. If you find yourself in Southern California, come hit me up. Let's grab a beer together. Uh, signing off, Bruin Bible, episode six, Brian Brown. Lights out.